Hey guys, I'm Isaiah Truthman from Overclock TV. This is OMG Overclock Mod Gaming, your new podcast or actually a live show as well. Um, to, for this episode, actually, I will be hosting it. It's been a while. I haven't been on the show for a few reasons. I was traveling quite a lot for uh, the different businesses that uh, we have and the different trade shows. Uh, thanks to Timothy for taking care of hosting the show for the past few weeks. Uh, actually, today is a day off in Quebec, so that's why Timothy is not doing the show. And uh, I am in France, uh, so this is why I can do it uh, on this uh, new time. Uh, we're doing it on a Monday, which is not quite common. Uh, usually we do that on a Friday afternoon. We're trying new uh, new things, start testing out. If it is actually easier for us to run that on a Monday or any other day of the week rather than a weekend, let us know if it's actually easier for you guys to actually catch it. It's a little bit sooner as well, uh, as where I am in Europe and uh, our guest for tonight, Gab, is in Europe as well. Uh, so let us know what you think in the comments uh, or directly on the Facebook page on uh, facebook.com forward slash overclicking TV in one word. Uh, so let's, uh, let's dive into it. Uh, tonight we have a special guest, Gavin. Uh, Gavin, how are you doing? I'm not too bad. And how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. It's it's pretty hot here. I don't know if it's the same in UK. Um, we're expecting a thunderstorm any moment, actually. <laughs> Believe it or not. So, so let's hope there's no not gonna be anything cutting up the either the internet or the electricity uh, for the for the show. Otherwise, yeah, you know, <laughs> no. uh, sometimes you have issues with the sound and sometimes you just have no internet whatsoever. So let's I'm not, I'm not worried. So I'm good. <laughs> let's try to avoid that. Uh, let's, uh, you know what, uh, let's uh, present a little bit about yourself. It's been a long time we know each other. We have been seeing each other for, for quite some years uh, already. But for exactly, all the people yeah. that don't know you, so Gavin, who are you? My name is Gavin. I am the motherboard slash memory editor for Anantec um, in the US. But as you can probably tell by my accent, I live, well, I'm from the UK. I live in the UK. Um, I've been at Anantec now for both since 2017. So... Probably, well, yeah, it's about two and a half years now I've been there, um, mainly focused on motherboards, um, analysis, um, scaling analysis with memory and CPUs, um, and pretty much what Ian tells me to do, really. <laughs> it's pretty... <laughs> so, so you're doing the, the monkey work, basically? Basically, yeah. Um, I'm Ian's little monkey. He's the organ <laughs> grinder who makes me dance. Uh, everything's last minute, of course, but yes. Oh, you know, that's uh, that's how it is in the, in, the, in the press and the media world. Um, today's show will be actually about the whole Computex. And that's going to be pretty interesting because, yeah, you were a Computex virgin. What did you thought about I the was. show? I, uh, the show on a whole, I actually enjoyed it. I thought it was a great show. couple of organizational issues, but there is, it's definitely an experience. It's, it's, it, it's such a beautiful city as well that it's that it's held in in taipei in taiwan um they, i don't think they could pick a better location for it um especially with the all the companies hqs being local to the area as well so they can I've, i mean i've never been to likes of ces but i take it with, with computex they, they put a lot of the marketing resources directly into it now, that was interesting so that was your first time and people know you at a, as a big party boy, but you were on the party band for that week. Yeah. So, so that was quite a first for both. I think I only got drunk three times in, in the space of two weeks, which is quite a, an achievement. <laughs> especially mean, for me. Especially for you, indeed. Um, that being said, um, as you say, like this is held in Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, this is one of the big trade shows of the year as well. Um, how did you cope up with the with the weather? Because it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty harsh conditions, like super humid, super hot. Uh, how was it for you as a first timer? Well, I'm used to, I'm used to like a 25 degree Celsius as a heat wave for where I from where I'm from. Um, so to be in 34 degree heat with 90 percent humidity while going around the show floor in a suit, that was a very interesting experience and one I actually really enjoyed. Um, it was it was quite enlightening as well. I've never been to Asia before, so it, it, it's people who have never been to Asia and you go to you go somewhere hot on holiday like Spain or France or Miami. It's a completely different type of heat. It's just smack in the face type of warmth. As soon as you walk outside, it's it's a mixture of like wetness and heat at the same time, and it it just cooks you. It really just cooks you inside. 
And what have been striking me the most for like almost like a little bit more than 10 years going to, to Taipei every year uh, is the fact that when you go outside, super hot and humid. And once you go inside, super cold and dry because AC is going full out. Yeah. So, so you have this balance every time you go somewhere. Like even when you get into the bus, like the AC is like, like at maximum all the time. So it's pretty, you have to get used to that as well. And I think as well with with um, with an Antec, the way we arranged the meetings, we we arranged all of our meetings for the least amount of travelling time, so we didn't have to walk outside just to to to, to, well, to minimise that. So we didn't have to go through that extreme heat and the humidity. Because it's not the heat that I found the problem; it's the humidity that that's what I found uncomfortable. But overall, it was apparently it was one of the coolest years. Uh, yes, indeed. Actually, I, it was one of the. Uh... Uh, easiest to do in terms of weather in well, 10 years i picked the right time then <laughs> well good so you're going to be ready for next year to be a little bit more you know harsh I'm on, on looking, that. <laughs> looking forward to it i really am awesome so let's dig in into the technicalities of uh going to computex and what is Computex. so for for a publication like adam tech which is very uh, tech oriented very uh, deep dive into the into the, the different technical details and so on um, how much work does a show like Computex represent for for a site like uh, like Anantec? Oh, the the workload's insane. Um, I mean, I can't speak for other types of media, um, but I was me me and Ian because it was three of us this year. There was me, Ian, Dr. Ian Cutrus, um, the senior editor of Anantec, and Anton Shilov, who is the main news editor for Anantec, and. I would, we would find that we would have pre-briefs, at, say eight o'clock in the morning. So we 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 would be out we would be out and up at the hotel from half seven, and we wouldn't get back till say seven, eight, or nine o'clock in the evening. So of course you've got meetings, pre-briefs, you've got keynotes, presentations, but we've also got to find time to put the content on the website at the same. It's a very hard balance. Because we're always we go from one meeting to the next to the next, and there's very little time for breaks. Um, but that's per, that's the perks and part and parcel of the the job, really, isn't it? It's you get you get used to it, and it took me a couple of days to get used to the schedule, but like I I, I enjoyed it a lot. So, so your biggest challenge was actually not just the workload, but the the fact you have to break the workload to actually publish stuff. Exactly. Yeah, it's finding the time it like in the taxi between meetings we, we would be writing content like you're trying to get out we, 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 it's more about being efficient i suppose than than anything else it's being efficient with your time and that's one thing that you've got to get 100 percent right at, at a trade show like computex especially for an antec it's uh, i was always being impressed by the work that uh the press and the media have been able to pull out on shows like this because it's a it's a non-stop influx of information and it's super hard to to nail down exactly what you have to say in the, in the really short you know, concise way especially when it's a written content exactly and just get it out of the door as fast as you can because it's it's sensible not sensible in terms of confidential but sensible information in terms of the time it is being published you can't wait two weeks to publish that because that's what that's going to be already like old news exactly there's the you know, there's no point posting it two weeks later. It's already out everywhere else. It's, but it's balancing the meetings, getting the content out in the the downtime. And when I say downtime, I'm talking hotels on the um, MRT. You know, anywhere you can get your laptop out and write content. But then you'd get pre-briefs that would that wouldn't be scheduled and meetings that wouldn't be scheduled. And they're like, oh, can you come? Can you come meet us? And it's it's a toss up, a real toss up between getting content out and going to meetings and doing the the pre briefs. I I would spend, bearing in mind, I said that we'd get out the hotel about half past seven. We'd get back say nine o'clock after we'd do the meetings, the briefs, the keynotes, dinners, and I'd be up till one or two o'clock in the morning writing, and then I'm back up again the next day at seven, and it's rinse and repeat. That's pretty impressive. So you were three people for Anand Take on the show. Uh, do you have a, a ballpark of how many pieces of content you managed to create for that week and actually have created from that week as well that maybe was published like the week after? Yeah, um, we did have... Trying, let, me, let me see if I can find that actually while, 
while we're going on because we got a massive amount of content out. Like uh, it's always tricky. So so there's the fact that um, uh, sites like uh, like publication like Anon Tech uh, publish mostly written contents, uh, but the the YouTube uh, players as well, like all the YouTubers, like uh, the Linus, uh, the Gamers Nexus, the Level One, they like all these guys that do, you no, know, videos and technical videos. Um, it's 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 a lot of time as well. I mean, uh, we talk, we have talked with uh, some of the uh, uh, editors and people like doing the editing. It's like okay, no, we're not going out tonight. Like the guys at Apple Canucks, like okay, it's 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 nine p.m. We just had like a quick dinner and we're actually just gonna be uh, editing all night. So it's pretty, uh, pretty insane as a, you know, as a, as a matter of what you have to publish and what you have to produce in that in that short amount of time. Yeah, I think looking at the 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 graph that I'm looking at at the moment, I think at the time between the time we got got to Computex, um, arrived in Taipei, and by the time we left, I think we got about sixty two articles out in that time, which for a team of three while having a full schedule from say seven or eight in the morning until you know six, seven o'clock in the evening that's quite a lot we we are we always beat tom's hardware who are like one of our sister sites from the future group we all and they had six members of staff but bearing in mind so they had double the output capacity but obviously we were just better in terms of efficiency that is pretty impressive that's that's at least that's uh almost three article per day per person while being on a full schedule that's insane yeah and then obviously once we'd finished computex and we went through the hq meetings and then went to you know when, when we flew back we had say about two weeks of just constantly computex news coming out it was at least five or six pieces each a day coming out and it so the the work, you think you get home from the plane and that's it for the work? No, the work continues for weeks afterwards just to get all the content out. So, mm. so yeah. So people think it's only one week, but it's actually more than three weeks with the preparation and so on. All exactly. Right. All right. Let's dive into the the core of Computex from this year. Uh, let's start with the main press conference. So the main keynotes. Uh, which one do you want to start with? Oh, it's got to be the AMD keynote. Ah, sure for that. All right. So, what was special about the AMD keynote? Ryzen three thousand. Um, everyone's been waiting, you know, to hear. Well, at the point they'd been waiting to hear details of the new SKUs, what was coming out, the the new X five seventy chipset. Um, and you know, it was, it was the first time. I think I think it's the first time at Computex AMD have done the opening keynote as part mm -hmm. of the opening show keynote as well. So it was quite interesting to see Lisa Sue um, on stage as well in actual person, as opposed to a video or just photographs. It was quite surreal. But the I don't know if you noticed it, but the buzz in the actual room itself, where where it was being held, it it, it was electric. It was. Yeah, everyone, I heard, I heard they, had, they had issues getting everyone in there. There was people that could not actually get into the keynote. Yeah, there was there wasn't enough space, and it was actually quite a big, a big um place where we held it. Was it the Hyatt? Was it no? It wasn't the Hyatt. It was the T I C C, right? That's yeah, the, yeah, it was. So the Taiwan Conference Center, International Conference Center. Yeah, it, it was quite big, and like I said, couldn't fit everybody in. It was, but the atmosphere was electric. People. People knew, I think a lot of the special depressing media knew what to expect, but actually getting the information out and the prices and it actually being confirmed was, was a different thing. And I mean, obviously we ourselves do our live blogs as well for, from the big keynotes. Um, so it was constant. Co it, it, we actually broke the site. Um, we did the best traffic we'd ever done on the Sunday for the last three years of Anantec. So oh, it, it, it was insane. So there was at this conference, at this keynote, you know, there was the official announcement of Ryzen 3000 series. Uh, so they announced up until the 12th course, the 16th course was announced uh, later down the road at E3. Um, so Zen 2 architecture, seven nanometers, uh, IUN chiplet. So basically like a new, like a new way of actually just targeting that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, process for, for CPUs. Um, they talked a little bit about the RX 
5700s, uh, uh, even though that was just teasing at the time, uh, which later was actually announced at E3. So that was no, not really unveiled, but uh, just teased, uh, teased out. Yeah. Uh, official launch for the CPUs, uh, when is that? And the official launch is July 7th. So two we- I think it's two weeks yesterday, um, 13 days time, we're going to get one, two, three, four, five, six, well, five, five new SKUs are going to launch, and then there's going to be a, the 16 core, which is was announced at E3, which is going to come later on. Um, but also, they're going to be announcing the X570 chipset, which they did a big unveil of uh, on the, uh, during the keynote as well. Um, but one thing they didn't they alluded to is the new APUs that they're bringing out, so the Ryzen 3000 APUs. Which I believe they're not actually seven nanometers, which is slightly disappointing. But I imagine seven nanometer APUs will come probably by the end of the year. I imagine that will come down the road. Like uh, like so far, like they are on seven nanometers, which is not the case for the the, the blue side as of now. So that's that's why it's yeah. interesting to see that. All right, um, what other keynotes do you want to talk next? Um, well, the Nvidia keynote I didn't attend. Um, I had the chance to go to the keynote. Um, but when speaking to the editor-in-chief, he said there would be no point because they weren't re- announcing anything new, which was slightly disappointing from NVIDIA. I was expecting more. But the Intel keynote was also quite interesting. Um, they, they seem to Intel seemed to have gone a slightly different approach to, to AMD, and they're all about innovating and being more efficient with the products and their architecture. Um, and you mean the process nodes? Yes, exactly. They're... Um, I mean, they're running slightly behind at the moment, and mainly due to stock issues. So they've got to they've got to sort of dress it up to look good, but at the same time not look doom and gloom, because obviously everyone was on a high from the AMD keynote. Still, uh, I still am on a high from the AMD keynote, um, but the Intel's keynote was very interesting. Um, so the, they announced the uh, 9900KS which is uh, all core at 5 gigahertz all the time uh, kind of CPU? Yeah, that was very interesting, actually. Um, it, it, it begs the question to, to Intel's marketing strategy. Um, all core 5 gigahertz all the time, which is better than the, the when they released, you know, the anniversary chip, the 8086, um, that was 5 gigahertz chip. It was, it was at one, it was one core, though, wasn't it, that was... Five gigahertz. I know it was five gigahertz, but I can't remember how um, many cores. I know it yeah, was think, not all the cores. Yeah, but I believe it was one call. Um, so it's it's interesting to see, you know, they, they, they've got the they, they've got the the willingness and they've got the the marketing budget. They've got the scope to, to release these products at five gigahertz and, and to keep up with current trends and to make things seem interesting. They've like I said, like you said, they brought out the i9 9900KS, and that's not even it's not even coming out until later on this year anyway. They announced Q4, so it's not, by, yeah. it's not before the end of the year, so it's, it was like a soft launch, basically, for, for that CPU. But the KF, which is the, the 9900K, but without the graphic yeah. uh, part on it, I think this one is already like launched. Yeah, I believe you can actually get it at retailers, but the KS isn't, like, like you said, it's going to be a Q4 um, it it could come end of Q3 possibly. Um, so I've been hearing, but I've also heard as well that it could be Q1 2020. So it's it's kind of interesting to see what what's going on because Intel are working a lot more on creating the perfect ecosystem as opposed to launching new CPUs, um, which is uh, which is completely different to how they've done things for the previous six years. Um, but like I said, due to the, the stock issues with the manufacturing, um, they, they've got to do something. Yeah, that's that's interesting to see them actually pushing and extending the life of the 14 nanometers process as well. And then, like, if you watch any of the TechTubers videos, uh, you will see them making fun of the 14 nanometers plus plus <laughs> plus 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 plus. Yeah. Uh, but as a matter of fact, it's still interesting to see that. It's impressive they're still on this process node, like still getting stuff out. So 
we'll see uh, we'll see how that turns out for them in uh, in the coming years uh, what are any other conferences that uh, that actually strikes you that either press event or keynotes or the, the, there's only one press event that really stood out to me um, and that was the Asus X570 motherboard launch. Now, they went into, well, during this conference, they didn't go into great detail at all. It was actually really rushed. And I spoke to um, one of the seniors at Asus when I went to HQ. Um, and and I, said to, I said to him, this conference was completely pointless. It was terrible. And they even, even agreed. He said, I should have done it. Um, for the level of information that they released. Um, I'm talking about Optimem. Now, Optimem is their new memory um, technology. So obviously you've got, you know, daisy chaining, you've got T-topology, which is the big memory, you know, technology at the moment when it comes to, you know, efficiency, frequency, latency, you know, connecting the, the CPU, the IMC to the memory slots. But Asus announced this Optimem now, they didn't go into any details because they're currently patent pending, so they don't want people to copy them, basically, which is fair. You know, people, companies are known to copy other companies' technologies. But, so, but know, they're already releasing that on new products. They are. They're going to be releasing it on so, the... So technically, anyone can buy a motherboard in the next two weeks. Yes, and but... find out, not all the details, but find out some of the details. Yeah, find out what what it is that they've actually modified to the board that is allowing them to, you know, to get ahead in the terms of memory speed and memory frequency, which is very interesting because we got briefed um, at HQ about this. Um, obviously, I can't talk any of the the finer details because it's one hundred percent NDA, um, and it, it, some of the details they, they wouldn't even share with us just in you know just in case, um, but. That is one of the things that I'm most excited to to see it in the next two weeks. But the conference itself, um, it was quite lackluster. Um, I've been to quite a few like press events in my time, and that one was very slapdash, rushed, and it was more for influencers, you know, YouTubers, and as opposed to like tech press itself. Um, there's, so there's that's actually a good point, like. You are from a very deep dive technical part of the industry, while most of the end users are actually not part of this. Or either, I mean, let's face it: like most of the viewers from the the YouTube worlds actually won't go read Anantech. Uh, I I personally put a point into reading Anantech every time I can. Um, Thank you. It's a, it's a nice read, and <laughs> I, I really love what uh, what Yan is writing, and it's it's actually pretty technical. It's very, you know, it gives a lot of insight that. Even part of the industry for ten years, that's something sometimes you can't really get anywhere else. Yeah. Um, so I really, I really appreciate and support that kind of writing. But let's face it, like most of the people won't be reading that every day. Uh, exactly. So it totally makes sense for someone in the in the industry to target where you can make the biggest noise, and then provide extra information to the more technical people like uh, like you guys. Um, but yeah. actually, that's that's a pretty good, um, pretty good. Topic because besides uh, CPUs from AMD and Intel, that like the new from AMD and the re I would say refreshed because it's not really refreshed are the new CPUs from Intel. Uh, on the motherboard side, everything was focused on X570. It was indeed, yeah. Um, it was insane. Like more than 50, I think more than 50 CPUs uh, were actually being shown at Computex. Like Asus at end stone biggest number of CPUs. Yeah, on they've, display. <laughs> they've they they they've they've gone fully full all out on um on their SKUs. Now a lot of the SKUs will be even though they've got a high number of SKUs, they won't all be available in every region. Some are region specific SKUs, but yeah, they've gone completely nuts. Um they've got as many SKUs as all the other vendors combined. Now, they have a lot of brands as well. I mean if you look at just taking Asus uh for this example, like on the X five seventy board. So they have all the Republic of Gamers, so ROG from like the, the top one, uh, like the Maximus uh, Crosser, Crosshair, whatever they're going to call it, uh, Extreme or Formula. I mean, they have the declination for each of them. Uh, and then you have the Strix, and then you have the Top, and then you have the Prime, and then you have the Workstation. Yeah. So um... technically, if you have like even five SKU for each of the brands, basically, 
that's going to be a lot of skills. It is, and I think to make a point, um, I think it's too many SKUs. Um, I mean, I, I would say a maximum of 10 SKUs from each vendor is the max, absolute maximum that should be offered. Offered, it. But the, a lot of the reason why a lot of other brands have got lower amount of SKUs is that this, during this launch, is Asus are, are offering Wi-Fi enabled boards, non-Wi-Fi enabled boards, and from from quite a few, quite a few different ranges. So from like the Rog, the the Crosshairs, but with the Hero, they've got a Wi-Fi Hero and non-Wi-Fi Hero, and they've done the same with a couple of the Strix boards as well. And it's it just adds confusion to the consumer. Um, I mean, it, it also adds an element of choice. You, you you can choose the board, but for the for the sake of ten bucks, ten dollars, it, it's probably better just to have the Wi-Fi, just in case, especially for Bluetooth as well. You know, Bluetooth five. Um, well, there's some restriction as well for uh, like the TPM, for example, the TPM connectors uh, that allows like uh, hardware encryptions that can't be sold in some countries. Yeah. So there's just like all this terms of like regulations and specification based on some countries. Uh, so it's like. From a media point of view, and I used to be media as well, I don't consider media anymore, but uh, from a media point of view, this is like like very overwhelming, in, not in a good way, because it's, there's too many SKUs to reviews and, and do things. But from a market perspective, it does make sense for segmentations. Uh, but I do totally yeah. understand your point. And actually, I agree with you on the point that there are too many SKUs per brand. Uh, and, maybe it, uh, and, and it, this leads to confusion on the consumer side. Totally, uh, yeah. I, I personally totally agree with that. Uh, so besides ASUS, there was um, ASRock, MSI, Gigabyte, they all had SKUs. Uh, which one was actually the most interesting take uh, for the X570 motherboard? For me, um, definitely ASUS. Um, because they brought, essentially they've brought back the Impact series, you know, the Mini MITX, Mini ITX, um, which is the last time that we've seen, I think, was Z170 on Intel's chipset, which t to me it shows that a lot of research and development and a lot of R&D money has gone into X570. And what also that tells me as well is they've got such high confidence in AMD's ability on 7 nanometers for these Ryzen 3000 chips that they're willing... Because if you look at X470, uh, an X370 as an example... The amount of high-end boards on X570, well, on X370, should I say, was quite minuscule. You know, a $300 board was a high-end board on X370. On X570, you've got boards that are like $800 that are high-end, $1,000 in some cases from Gigabyte. You almost have never it's, seen that on the AMD side, that's insane. The, the cheapest board currently that's due to release on the set on the seventh of July for X570 is hundred and eighty dollars. That is the cheapest X570 board that's going to be released, and that shows a big shift from the likes of the last two flagship um, chipsets from AM on the AM4 platform. Um, and it's it's absolutely crazy, but it does show that they've got you know confidence in AMD, which it's great. You've got you know, if you look at Z390, they had some in, in, incredible boards, incredible boards at the high end. X570 has completely trumped that with the, you know, you've got the, the Gigabyte Extreme, which it, it's one of, it's actually one of the only boards on X570. And I need to make a point about this is that they've got, it's got a passive cooled chipset heatsink because the X570 chipset itself is going to run up to 15 watts, which all the, all the vendors have took note of that, and they've applied active fan-cooled heat sinks, which it's an interesting design point. Um, but well, This is actually interesting to note that we are back to having fans on chipset. Yeah. I mean, that was going for years, and now we're back at to actually even mini ITX systems. Like, uh, I think the... I think the, not the gene, the impact from this is as an active cooling fan for the chipset on the mini ITX board, which yeah, it we does. have not seen for years. It's 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 incredible, and I mean the X570 chipset itself is the first 
chipset AMD has actually produced and manufactured in-house. It's still using AS Media IP, so it's still using their intellectual property, but it is the first chipset AMD has manufactured themselves. That, that, that has to be noted. So whether or not it will get refined in the future, um, it, it's the PCI Gen 4 that's causing the main power issues at the moment for them, which is making up the bulk of the power draw, which is why they need these active cooled heat sinks, which, like, like, you, like you were saying, Truth, it's been a long time since the chipset heat sink has needed the cooling fan. And but it's like we're going back in time, but at the same time, but we're actually going forward, especially with AMD more than we are Intel of recent years. That's, uh, that's going to be very interesting to look at how that turns out. Um, uh, one, one big concern that I had when I actually attended the show was PWMY, so power delivery wise for the CPUs. I mean, we are going for like 12. It was public knowledge that we, they, everyone was going to 16 cores, but no one knew exactly when that would be announced. Uh, people were expecting that to be announced at Computex when it was actually announced at E3. Yeah. Uh, but anyone knew that 12 cores was not the maximum on that platform. And when that was announced, people were like, wait a minute, it's backward compatible with AM4, but the real, the first AM4 motherboard were not designed for that kind of number of cores on the CPU as well, and power draw. So how does that gonna you know, cross over? And my biggest concern as an end user first was, are we gonna have the same kind of issue that we had on X299 first generation? It's like PWM challenges, uh, power draw for CPUs that don't uh, are not compatible with um, like previous generation motherboard, etc. Uh, what's what's your take on that? Well, I think with the the 16 core, the 3950X, which is going to be released later on in the year, the vendors themselves have had to create the boards with that in mind. So they've overestimated the power delivery specifications on, on, on quite a few of the boards. And in turn, they've also had to look at the thermal aspect as well with the, the heat sinks themselves. Now, I, I do I do believe there is going to be a couple... Look, look, having a look on the show floor and having a closer look at all the boards themselves, I do think there is going to be a couple of issues with, with running these 16 core CPUs on some of these... I don't like to call them lower-end X570 boards because... X570 itself is not low-end whatsoever. It is mid-range to high-end. The B550, which will eventually come, if that's what they call it, by the way, um, that'll be the lower-end. And they probably won't support the 16 cores, I imagine. Um, but vendors have had these 16 core chips for quite a while now. So they they are well-suited. And actually going to one of the HQs, and I won't disclose which HQ it was, but actually going to a HQ and, and actually sitting down with proper you know like proper power testing equipment um that that's not cpu based like it, it simulates the loads themselves and with thermal imaging and actually talking to the inf engineers who are, are very enthusiastic about this and they, they say it's been quite difficult to implement the the power deliveries on some of the boards um especially in terms of cost it's they're trying to make it more efficient price wise as well as you know, cooling um, situations where high loads plus plus quite incapable power deliveries are going to generate quite a lot of heat. But that is something I'm personally going to explore at Antec um, over the next month or so. Um, That's definitely going to be some interesting uh, work from you in the, in the upcoming weeks yeah. and months. And don't forget, you've got Buildzoid as well, who does fantastic power delivery analysis, which... You know, he, he. I feel he should get a lot of credit, and I think he's actually started publishing some of his X570. I actually did publish one earlier today, uh, about like nine or ten hours before we were recording this podcast. Oh, did you? Um, he did. Uh, did one of the analysis for the X570 Ultra from Gigabyte, I think. Oh, nice. But that wasn't that wasn't ES board. That wasn't the final design. So some stuff might still change. Uh, but no, actually, yeah. Shout out to uh, Buildzoid for his uh, PWM analysis. Uh, you can find it on actually hardcore overclocking or just look for builds with and usually that's that's gonna pop pop out. Yeah. Um, we, so let's so we talked a lot about this the, the AMD side of the CPU uh, and the motherboards. Um, I have one question before we switch back to another type of components. So there's 10, 12 and 16 cores. 
Yes. Can you can you explain why there's no 14 chords? Well, I believe, and looking at the design of the seven nanom- the, the way Intel have implemented the seven nanometer on the using the chiplet design, um, each chiplet is six cores. You know, on the actual mm-hmm. die itself, it, it, this this six cores. Now, when AMD when when they go for the yield, when they do the yield for, from the fabric from the fabrication process um, at the fab at the fabs um, where they where they actually make the silicon from the wafers, the the lowest yield they got was every chiplet that came out was a minimum of six cores. So that is the reason why there is going to be no fourteen car. Interesting. So that's not a a, a good multiple of. Uh... It's not no, basically. no. The, the, then that that is from my understanding. Um, that is definitely a question I'm going to ask Ian after this show. Um, just, <laughs> I'm, just, sure just knows, I'm sure he knows. I'm sure he knows the small details about that. Uh, oh, he would, and he takes great pleasure in finding out those kind of details and doing <laughs> nothing with the information. It's yeah. The thing is, if we do a show with Ian, I will be asking him questions for like four hours, <laughs> and I know he doesn't have four hours to be on a show. <laughs> yeah, I know he's. He's he's rarely in one place at the moment, and he's yeah. just moved house as well. So it's busy time for him. Yeah, I was happy we could spend time uh, see each other during uh, during the the Computex week. Uh, I know it's uh, super busy for everyone, so uh, I really appreciate the, the the time. All right, let's uh, move to next uh, type of components. Um, so besides CPUs and motherboard, which actually is you know, pretty much still part of the show uh, for that Computex week. Uh, there was a lot of new other uh, components. Like, uh, so let's talk first about the the keys. Uh, which one did you interest uh, the most? Even though that might be not your, you know, most biggest focus, I would say. Um, probably at Computex itself, one of the the, the best cases I've seen was from Bit Phoenix, and it wasn't so much like the best, you know, in terms of technical design, but it was the aesthetics. If, if, if you know what I mean, it, it was the the use of addressable RGBs, and a lot of case manufacturers seem to have made addressable RGB the new standard. So it's kind of moved on from RGB as such to ARGB, um, and as well, um, NZXT have a great new range as well. Um, it's going to be released um, in the coming months. Uh, I don't know if you if you actually seen any of them. Did you did you go around? I haven't seen the NZXT because I think they were in the suite, right? They were not on the Fisher. Yeah, they were in the Hyatt yeah. suite. Yeah. I didn't um, have the time to go to Hyatt this year. Usually I do Hyatt the first two day and then I do uh, Nangang, so exhibition hall. Uh, but this year I actually spend a hundred percent of my time in Nangang uh, for okay. the first time in ten years. Well, what NZXT have done is with their the H510 lineup or the H series. They've completely refreshed them to feature addressable RGB. Um, but one interesting point that they've, they've added is they've put front panel USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports on the IOs of the these cases, which I think, I believe it's one of the only manufacturers to do that across virtually one of their entire ranges. I mean, obviously, with front panel USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-C, it's all reliant on whether or not the motherboard has the connect. Mm-hmm. Oh, did we did we just lost Gav? I think we just lost him. So maybe there was the, the sounder. I'm not. Oh, you're back? No, no, I'm here. All can right. You, I, I can hear you. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, continue, continue. So uh, the Sorry, fact it's... that uh, they have this, um, it, it's hard for manufacturers to get the uh, the latest USB standards on hold their uh, the product. Yeah, um, and I mean it's interesting that they've done that on pretty much their entire PHC re- refresh range. Given that manu- the mother, it's all down to the compatibility of the motherboards. Now it's good for for users that want you know USB Type C connectivity on the front panel, but it also adds extra cost that. You know, people may not want to pay because I personally don't use Type C at all on my board. I mean, I, I, all I use the Type C port for is for an extra 
few USBs for, for a Type C hub because I don't want to use any of the Type A's that I've got because I use a lot of USB devices. But in terms of design, it was there was a concept case that NZXT. Uh, the best way to describe it, it was like the Fantex Evolve ITX case. It's similar to that, but it was like a tower shape uh, mini ITX. So it was a small footprint, kind of like a rectangle cube um, shape cube, but it also but it came inclusive of uh, an AIO CPU cooler from NZXT and the power supply as well. So all users would need to do was buy motherboard, CPU, RAM, and well, storage. Basically, anything that and GPU. NZXT is not doing. Basically, yes. Well, even yeah. though they are doing motherboard, but on ATX. Yeah, um, the, the, well, technically ECS doing their motherboard, but yeah, they, they just put like a, a metal cover over the top of it and call well, it a, well, their motherboard. Let's say it's public knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, interesting. I agree. Interesting. Uh, were there any other uh, case or case mod or concept kit that uh, that were interesting for you on the show? Um, there was the. I, I, I don't know if it was. It's entirely positive, but the. I don't know if you got the chance to see the, the in win concept design, the three D printed cases. Mm -hmm. At all? Did you see them on the show floor? They, it it yes. was kind of like a spider web of such, but it was a very expensive spider. I think it's about four thousand dollars. Per well, it's, one. it's part of the uh, limited edition that Inwin is doing like pretty much every year. So they do like a limited run of some artistical concept one. Uh, there was the spider web and there was the one that looked like um, the laundry garbage thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I don't know the, uh, the name. Like the concept was interesting from where it came from. Uh, but when I first saw it, I was like, I actually, I saw it after the show was closed. So after 6 oh. p.m. So for me, I thought that was a cover for the case to not get dust overnight. Yeah, no, that is actually the case. And it's the interesting thing about it is it's 3D printed. But it's $4,000. So you'd expect a 3D printed case to be cheaper to manufacture, but it's for some reason, because it's in when then it's a concept case and conceptual, $4,000. And I'm, 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 50 50 on the design of it it's the one thing that inwin are very good at is creating unique styling on cases and it's certainly unique well it was unique uh, but i'm not entirely sure when um they're gonna hit retail and they, i imagine they're gonna be a limited run and mo and it's likely that you know case modders are likely to get them and there'll be maybe a hundred available or something like that they'll be very exclusive thanks yeah for sure. Um, on 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 one point, like I I liked the concept case of the mini ITX build that was on was that I think Cooler Master Group had this uh, submersion cooling mini ITX build because the submersion cooling are usually for the big uh, the big massive computer like HPC like high performance computers uh, used for data centers or computing like heavy computing and so on. But yeah. this one was actually a mini ITX one with everything actually built in. So that was actually an interesting take on, uh, on the concept. I, I find it pretty interesting. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually a big lover of mini ITX pieces. So that's why actually, uh, I actually... I love MITX. Uh, I, I didn't actually see that case, but did you see the the the, the mini ITX system they built into a Threadripper package? Do you want the Threadripper box? Oh, that was on Alpha Cool. That was Alpha Cool, yeah, yeah that, that was... But that was not mini ITX. That was, uh, was, that was not... another form factor. Ah, I think I that was, was that was like a like not like a new form factor, a little bit bigger. Um, but that was uh, that was actually a pretty so yeah that was using a thread ripper box with a full PC inside. So that was pretty clever design. It was very good. I mean, we we actually covered it. Ian Ian took one look at it and was like, "Where do I get one?" It was <laughs> the design of it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, is there any um, other kind of component that actually uh, interested you there, like keyboard, mouses, RGB stuff, cooling? Believe it or not, no. Um, the, the the only thing that actually really piqued my interest in terms of like peripherals was a small. Um, it was like a small USB sound card that you. So it was USB to three point five mil, and it was kind of like an amplifier. And it was, it's about twenty five dollars. 
Um, I'm trying to exactly remember what the model number of it it was. I can't exactly remember what it is. That that that's quite bad. Um, I think it was Sharkoon. Yeah. Hi-Fi, like high fidelity audio. Yeah, it was. Um, it's basically like a little adapter. So, um, it's like a little DAC, USB DAC, a very cheap DAC. Now they wouldn't go into the details of the components inside it. I assume there was a reason for that. Um. But essentially, you plug it into your system, you plug your headphones into the 3.5mm jack in it, and it improved the bass quality. Now, I actually got hands-on with it, and it did improve the audio quality. It put a bit more bass through it. It wasn't tinny. It actually sounded quite good. And, yeah, I'm actually looking to get my hands on one, if I can remember the model number and who it is I need to contact to get one. Not for review. I just want one. Um just to improve the the audio quality, you know, of my on my spare PC, um, so I can listen to music everywhere I go with with good quality audio because audio is a big factor to me. Yeah, um, yeah we all have the uh, we all have like the small interest. Oh, uh, um, there was a new trend as well, like those like gaming station seats that you can get in and so on. Oh. Uh, what do you think about that? Because Acer had one, Cooler Master had one, um, like pretty much everyone had one at the show. See, I, I being brutally honest, I'm not a big fan of them. Um, they're expensive. I mean, they look good, but you know, I I I'd rather just stick with my IKEA desk. It's it's cheap, it's practical, and if I break it, I can replace it cheap enough. Whereas, you know, the, the question for me is where the warranty comes into 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 a, a product like that. So you have you know, to ship it yourself back to Aramee. Yeah, exactly, and <laughs> and, and that is not going to be cheap. And, and plus, the the initial outlay um, for it, every, everyone's doing these, the, these these like desk designs, and um, personally, I am not a fan of them, um, especially the ones of RGB. Not that I've got a problem with RGB, but when it, I'm just. I like RGB on a keyboard and a mouse and, you know, case fans. I don't need it on my monitor. I don't need it on my desk. I don't need it on my headset. And I certainly don't need it on the gaming chair. On the backpack? Yeah, exactly. It's it's going crazy now, RGB. And it, so Actually, speaking of RGB, so do you think the RGB everything trend is actually dying a little bit out and then everyone gets used to it and then that's fine? Or it's actually just getting stronger or worse depending on what you think about that? It, it, you speaking to a lot of manufacturers at Computex, RGB is big business. It, it sells a lot of products for companies. And I just can't understand why. I mean, that's just my personal opinion. It's it's the new standard now. RGB is just sta- standing in virtually everything. And it's... I don't, know if you're, I don't know what your personal opinion of it is, Truth, but I'm... To me, it's just the norm now. It's... The normal product is just RGB enabled. You can switch it off or you can switch it on. It's to, to answer your questions, I used to be against RGB the way it was done at first. Yeah. But, but addressable RGB is what we should have got from the beginning. Because addressable RGB gives you opportunity to create specific yes. uh, patterns and special, uh, specialties. Um, and as, as an example, uh, a lot of people actually came to me during the, the past few months uh, because my laptop have an RGB keyboard, but it's not doing the rainbow mode all the time. It's actually getting into a specific use case, like numbers of a specific colors, uh, specific uh, key touch pad, like touch on the keypad at specific colors as well. But this is for work purposes. This is to be more yeah. efficient at work. So there's actually a purpose to do it. And this would not have been the case if you watch just like going through all the colors all the time. Uh, now that we have addressable LGBs, uh, it's more than just one LED and then one LED. It's more smooth. Uh, it's more precise as well. Um, I think we're getting towards something correct. Uh, the biggest challenge I do think still exists in the industry is interoperability between the different formats and the different yeah. color and different components. Unless yeah. there is a full open framework that everyone is using, I think that's still going to be to the not in the benefit of the customer. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, 
ARGB or dressable RGB is definitely what we should have been, you know, given at first. It, it's it just looks that much better. I, I, like addressable RGB itself is it's slightly more expensive to implement, but it's definitely worth it for the for the design. Um, everything just looks a lot more seamless, and every that seems to what, what I've noticed to have been the shift, especially at Computex, is that brands are refreshing series like ranges from last year with RGB with ARGB now, and it's it, I think it's going to start becoming the norm towards the end of this year that every product will have like addressable RGB, and like like you were saying that you, you've actually got a practical use for it. You know, for me, um, with things like key bindings, it's great to have a dressable RGB where I can have like different zones of a keyboard and different, so I can just look at a color and I know that if I press that, that'll do a specific thing for me. Um, especially when editing lots of writing, it, it's good to have um, key binds. But yeah, addressable. Um, one, I do want to bring up one note is Gigabyte on their motherboards. They've got a different pin layout to every other brand and what's the compatibility the cross compatibility then becomes an issue now because that means manufacturers with ARGB products have got to include an adapter to use it with gigabyte boards and I, I just can't actually get my head around why they've done that it's well the, the that comes back to my points unless there's a large open source with everyone involved and then everyone bidding to use that format, that's not going to be into the uh, the good way of the of the end users. Exactly, I agree. Um, so besides everything we talked today, like like PC components, uh, the audio plug that you you were, is there anything you you have to you have to to name to one thing that you're eager to review? Like what is the the thing you want to get for review, and what is the thing? you think well, was not belonging to Computex whatsoever? The one thing that I, because obviously I review motherboards, so it's, if if I take that out of the equation, one thing I actually would love to get my hands on is that Noctua fanless cooler. Uh, I, I know you've seen it because I'm, I've seen you at the Noctua booth with the OBT mounted onto the wall, which was absolutely amazing, by the way. Um, I actually emailed Noctua and said good job on using the OBT because it was nice to actually see it on the actual show floor, which actually is we're, great. Actually, we were pretty surprised on how they were using it because we did not knew as well uh, before the show and we're happily surprised on how they were actually using the, the board. And for those of you guys that haven't seen that, you can just go to the Open Bench Table Facebook page and there's the pictures actually there. So, uh, the the, the 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 cooling solution from the uh, can you describe a little bit more what it was yeah so essentially it was like a, a big block of aluminium it was like a this the same way like a tower cooling design like an air cooled tower but obviously with no fans so it has the capabilities currently because it is a con complete concept at the moment um to dissipate 120 watts of heat so on the the show floor they had it um with a like a desktop processor, so it was the i9 from Intel. It was an i9 9900K. Um, now, although on the show floor itself, um, it, it's very hot in Taipei, by the way. So, like a general use case scenario, it's not going to be that the ambient temperatures are not going to be that warm. But the performance from it, you know, keeping uh, a 9900K cool, um, uh, it was around 94 degrees. I measured it at. Um, bearing in mind the ambience a lot higher, so I would imagine it'd be about 85 to 86 in a gen in my room. It'll probably be about 80 degrees with, with the low ambient. Um, but to actually have a completely fanless CPU tower cooler that is capable of keeping a premium desktop SKU like the i9 9900K cool under full load is absolutely amazing. Uh, maybe I'm just weird that that that, that kind of makes me enthusiastic but i'm i i was actually really buzzing off that it was because i would use i mean if you're if you're doing this if you're doing audio editing the last thing you want is a cpu cooler to be going full pelt uh, and you know getting in the audio especially if you're using a sensitive mic yeah there's two things you don't want 
exactly the fan, yeah the fan noise and electrical noise exactly and ha- having a design like that and, and, and i actually hope to see more manufacturers working on this because people assume that liquid cooling is quiet it's not quiet if you i can hear the pump over the fan and it's it sort of detracts yeah i can keep my cpu cooler but it's not necessarily quieter and i, I really like quiet running components and to, to see that concept design was to, to i mean you can probably tell on my face I, i'm absolutely buzzing off it and you know up to 120 watts of, you know of thermal essentially thermal heat dissipated from with zero fans to me is absolutely fantastic and i can't wait to see it hit the market i really can't awesome and what is the thing that from your point of view should not be at computer days Ugh, gaming chairs. Every blue, every manufacturer had their own gaming chairs now. Uh, and you, you, it just, I just don't feel it's got... I just don't think gaming chairs are all that they're cracked up to be. They're, they're, not, they're not actually designed ergonomic. A lot of them are not ergonomic. So you, you, when you're sitting at a computer for a long period of time, you need something that is ergonomic to keep your back, to keep your spine, the curvature of your spine, you know, correct so that you don't get aches and pains pulling muscles. You're not damaging your spine, you know, over a long period of time. And gaming chairs are just, ugh. The, and yet there, there, was, there was actually one thing on the show floor as well. Um, one manufacturer actually had the, the Ryzen apus on a system with a keyboard and mouse plugged in so interesting yeah so some sites are actually benching the the, the bearing in mind amd hadn't actually announced it yet which is the amazing thing you so know the, see this was computex 10 years ago you could just go on the trade show you know stuff we getting announced uh in the coming weeks or month and you know that the industry partners are actually working on it. And you know that if you're good enough, you can you know, spot things and, and get leaks and so on. But this was tracked down so hard over the past few years because, well, there was not really like upcoming battle between the two giants for that kind of the mar- on yeah. that market. But now that it is, like having that kind of like leaks uh, is actually pretty exciting even though that's sometimes not in a good way. but uh, Yeah, and, and the fact that AMD is so tight when it comes to keeping their information and all the cards locked behind closed doors so that no one can find out this information, and then some manufacturer has an unannounced CPU from their lineup in, in a system, and the rule of thumb is they can have it on display, but you're not allowed the keyboard and mouse into it. They just had a keyboard and mouse plugged into it, and pe- certain tech media were just going up to it and like, yeah, I'll just run this benchmark, get the data, and then they were, off they went. And it's like, like it, we saw a lot of system from uh, from the upcoming um, upcoming CPUs and motherboards and the yeah. upcoming platforms. Like it's in the box, it's running. You have the screen, it's running, but you can't plug anything, you can't get close to it, you can't actually access that. So that was uh, that was interesting. All right, um, Gav, I think we are at the we're at the end of the show. Um, in terms of closing the show, what will be your takeaway as a first timer at Computex? Um, very warm, very humid, very busy, but the culture surrounding Computex is absolutely amazing. The food, the weather's great when it's not raining when especially when there's no air raid and like missile test drills that's interesting that was definitely very interesting to experience um I, I, actually for the people that don't know uh, taiwan is running a military air drill every year and for the past two or three years it is actually happening on the first day of computex technically for one i think it's one hour no one has the right to be in the street you have not the right to be in the street so the city is completely dead. Everyone is inside. The thing is, when you don't know about that, it's literally like you have this, you have the sirens, you have the alarms, you have everything, and then no one in the street, and no one lets you actually go in the street. So yeah, I am, I'm, I'm not surprised you were actually impressed about that. 
I know we're running out of time, but one thing that was very funny and interesting during that siren is a lot of people, I mean, I knew about it beforehand because Ian keeps me up to date with everything, but it actually started thundering. So all you could hear was the sirens and then these big, massive, loud bangs. And if you'd never been there before, you'd be like, what's going on? What's actually happening if that would be your first time there? And it was... It was just surreal to actually finally be at Computex after about... I mean, I've been in the media industry now for about nine years, and this was the first chance I actually got to go, and I'm not going to miss a year now. I'm going to be there next year, the year after, the year after that, and it's... It is a... I say it's a a once-in-a-lifetime experience, but... And it's a lot of hard work, but it's definitely worth it if if you want to see new technology and you know keep up to date with what companies are, are releasing because there's nothing like quite being in a keynote when an exciting product is being announced the actual atmosphere in the room is actually is absolutely electric and the buzz that you feel of just walking around and people are excited and enthusiastic it's it's one of the biggest gatherings of worldwide tech press in the world and, and I, I can I can definitely like agree and follow you on that. Like after ten years attending Computex, like the thrill of going there every year is still there. Like even after ten years in trade show, I don't have that. I did not have that for Civic. I don't have that for CES. I really have it for Computex as well. So that's pretty interesting. Definitely follow you on that. Uh, thank you very much, Gav. Quickly, what are you working on right now that you can talk about it? Um, what I can talk about um. Technically, I mean, I can say X, I can say X570, but I can't say anything more than that because it's still uh, one thing as well that we haven't mentioned. And AMD announced there is going to be no um, X570 unboxings before the 77. They were going to do them at the end of the month on the 30, I think the 31st or the 1st of July. They were going to allow tech to, tech press to unveil the boards and do unboxings and you know cpu unboxings amd have scrapped that so everything comes out and is 100 percent nda until 7 7 that's the 7th of july okay so as a listener or a viewer for this uh you won't get any extra information before official information before the 7th of july is that, should... is that 7 a.m at seven minutes past seven a.m or is, is there something like seven 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 all the way I'm not going to lie, I can't remember the, the time, <laughs> the actual time on 7-7 that it is. But I, I don't have to worry about that time. I, I let Ian worry about that. But I, I imagine it'll be about 2 o'clock GMT, which is 4 p.m. CET. I, I believe that is the time. But Let's it, find out on the 7th. Yeah, it's, it's a Sunday as well, so it's a very crazy day to launch a product. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, well, thank you very much, Kevin, for being here with us uh, for for this podcast, OMG, and, uh, and the live shows as well. Uh, thank you very much for all the listeners and all the people watching this live on Twitch. Uh, keep in mind that uh, you can support us by subscribing on our YouTube channels uh, or actually get uh, find more shows like this wherever you get your podcasts on other podcast platforms, that being on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, uh, name it. Uh, we actually just promote that uh, pretty broadly. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, uh, Overclicking TV in one word. You can find us on Twitch, Overclicking TV in one word. If you want to support us, uh, there's a donation system on the Twitch uh, channel that you can get uh, or send us to, uh, to, to that gets to PayPal and so on. Uh, share the show. If you like what we're doing, uh, one of the big uh, support, besides actually financial support, is actually sharing the show with your friends, like sharing it with the different topic or let us know what kind of topics you want us to discuss in the next uh, in the next episode um, that's it for today see you next time and thanks for having me thank you gav it's always a pleasure to have you here and like, i'm more than happy to do a new a next show with you thank you very mm -hmm. much Bye bye goodbye <laughs>